Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Libya. Libya is located in northern Africa and it borders Tunisia up here. This is the border with Algeria. Niger is the border down here and this is the border with Chad. Here, oh, can you see? There we go. <laughs> the border with Chad. Here's the border with Sudan and the border with Egypt. And you know what I always say on my channel about borders? Mother Nature doesn't make straight lines. That's a man-made border and typically if it's just straight through, there's nothing there to demarcate the borders between countries. So we'll learn more about that area in a bit. There we go. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Libya has a long, long Mediterranean coastline. You can see this area here is called the Gulf of Sirte, named after the city right here of Sirte. But in terms of geography, Libya has three traditional regions. The first will be Tripolitania, named after the capital city of Tripoli up here. Tripolitania was the breadbasket of Rome in ancient times. Very, very fertile. And yeah, it is, I'm filming this on a Saturday, so there might be some loud cars. I apologize. Anyway, and you can see some wadis in the area. Those are temporary rivers that only exist during wet seasons. And for the most part, that's about it. Many, many, many people live in this area. Pretty much the majority of Libya's population lives up in here. Next we have Cyrenaica, which includes kind of like this whole area over here. Cyrenaica is a bit like Tripoli in that it is also very fertile and has a coastline. The main difference, the main ancient difference, is that this area was Greek, this area was Roman, but uh, we'll get to that during history. The geography is pretty much the same. It's more of a cultural difference, which we'll talk about during history. It's, it's not that different, but it's different enough, you know. <laughs> and lastly, we have the Fazan, which is this whole deserty area here. And it is very, very deserty. This is the Sahara. You get the ARA in Sahara is right there. It is very sandy, very, very, very hot. And of course, like freezing cold in the night. This section over here is the Libyan desert. There's some really interesting volcanic formations throughout the area. And there are quite a few oases in Libya. The most interesting one is Al Kutra over here. And uh, there'll be a picture in the book I'll show you after history. But I encourage you, if you're ever on Google Earth, to look up the Al Kufra oasis. It is a very interesting landscape. Um, Libya has a lot of underground water that's been there for tens of thousands of years, if not longer. So that water comes up through the earth and creates oases. So the oases out here are actually like very fertile. So there's some interesting agriculture practices happening here in Al Kufra. Again, there'll be a little picture, but seeing it on Google Earth, it looks like some kind of bizarre Martian alien landscape. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Check it out. And let me see, for the most part, yeah, that's about it. It is sandy, it is hot, it is arid, and then up here is much more lush and tropical and good for agriculture. And I mean, you have the Mediterranean right here. You can kind of see Sicily right here. It's, it's a beautiful part of the world, right? All along the Mediterranean coast. So let's talk about it in relation to its history, because of course people would have settled in the area for a very, very long time. There's actually some really interesting rock out art out in Libya. It's like over here in this area called Tadrart Akakis. And the art is very interesting in that it depicts this area as being very lush, 
very tropical, green, lots of animals. They have paintings of rhinoceroses and elephants and all of the African animals you associate with like the more savanna, more lush, non-deserty areas of Libya. And as the art, you know, progresses through the years, you can actually see it changing to becoming more about survival other than just the animals that are out and about in Libya. It's also very hot today, so I have the window open. I might go close it in a minute because the cars are going to be loud. I'll always edit out the worst ones. You guys know that. Anyway, so that's pretty much what happened in this area in ancient times. The Sahara used to be very, very lush. It's believed that the Earth's axis was slightly altered so that this corner of the world faced the sun more directly and it turned into a desert and people had to leave. So the um, earliest people that we know in the area would have been the Berbers, but there's a really interesting culture kind of within that called the Garamantes. And they, um, you can see Garia up here, they were kind of in this area, still are today, still a very interesting ancient culture worth looking up. And um, not a lot of time to get into it today, but very interesting ancient peoples who are still around, still doing their thing in a more modern aspect. The Phoenicians sailed all throughout the Mediterranean Sea, checking out what was available for them to explore, and they established trading posts along the Libyan coast, but their prize city would have been Carthage up here, which became so powerful it was its own entity, its, its own power, and Carthage would have controlled this area over here until, of course, the Romans defeated Carthage during the Punic Wars, and the area was claimed by Rome as they took over Carthage. Meanwhile, over here, this area was populated by Greek people. The earliest settlements we know were in 630 BCE. They established a place called Cyrene, hence Cyrenica. Eventually, the Persians came into this area, mainly Cambyses II conquered it for the Achaemenid Empire, so when Alexander marched through, Alexander the Great, I should say, marched through, who is Greek slash Macedonian, the Greeks living here were very excited and welcomed him with open arms. Alexander had a very good time in Egypt in this corner of Africa while he was out conquering. So this area fell under the Ptolemaic dynasty, which Ptolemy was one of Alexander's generals who took over after Alexander's very sudden death. But eventually the area was given over to Rome. It was annexed, oh, I didn't write down the year, but um, it would have been after like Cleopatra fell and all that mess with Caesar, you know, <laughs> they lost a lot of power over here. So it was given to Rome. And the area was thriving. You know, I used to play a computer game called Caesar 3, which was kind of like SimCity, but you're building an ancient Roman city. And I would always play in Libya because it was so easy. It was like easy mode. There was always enough farmland. There's always enough water. And there was peace. It was a, a nonviolent area. If you played anywhere else in like Europe, you would have barbarian invaders coming to your town and wrecking it and you'd have to build up a military force. Whereas if you played in Libya, all you had to do was just build up a population and farm and pay tribute. That's all you had to do. It was so easy and so fun. I'd always play in Libya. I never liked the fighting aspect of that game. The most bountiful city in this area would have been Leptis Magna, which is um, kind of over here. It was the home of a Roman emperor named Emperor Severus. He really, you know, whenever an emperor came from an obscure location within the empire and they had the funds to build up their hometown, they took advantage of that. So Leptis Magna had quite a very long kind of golden age, very prosperous, along with the other uh, cities over here. There were three major ones that combined, hence Tripoli, three cities. And for a while it was going good, you know, until it didn't, until the Roman Empire collapsed 
and the Vandal Barbarian tribe came in and took over. Eventually the area was slowly reconquered by the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, but that all changed around 647, kind of 649 that, that time. The Arabs came in and took over um, went one, two, three, conquering this area, bringing with them the religion of Islam, which was very well accepted by the people here, especially the Berber tribes really liked the religion, still do today. Not so much the, the Arab control, but they really vied with the religious aspect of it. Now, during its early Arab years, there were a lot of dynasties. I mean, I... I skip over all the different feuds in the, the Arab world, in the European world, in the Southeast Asian world, because there were just so many that would replace each other after 100, 200 years or so. The Umayyads would have been first, the Abbasids took over the Umayyads, the Fatimids came in, which was a Shiite branch, so there was some conflict there. Um, the, actually the, the Normans came from France and tried to take over, the Aglubids took over after that, so on and so forth. There is a lot. At one point in the 1500s, the Spanish came, and the Ottomans were the ones to drive them out and reclaim the territory, and it became part of the Ottoman Empire. And it officially stayed that way until the end of the Ottoman Empire, but it was really the, the powers within it that controlled pretty much all of Libya. The Ottomans weren't conquerors, they were tax collectors, so as long as they got paid, you guys could do whatever you wanted. So there was quite a lot of civil war and unrest and conflict among all the different powerful families and groups and leaders and piracy sprang up along the coast known as the Barbary Pirates. I talk more about them in the Algeria and Morocco episodes. They would, you know, charge tribute to people to not raid their ships and kidnap their crew and sell them into slavery, which is kind of like a big business over here. And at one point, they messed with this brand new country called the United States, who didn't take too kindly to these high tribute payments, so they attacked, and man, these pirates got beat by these very early Americans, like 1800s, like prior to the War of 1812. And the, the pirates lost a lot of power after that, and would eventually phase out. In the early 1900s, Italy and the Ottoman Empire went to war, which involved Italy coming and taking over their lands here in Libya, officially claiming it in 1912 and deciding to annex it and make it, making it a part of Italy, with the idea that their ancient Roman ancestors built magnificent cities and had all this history in the area to be rightfully theirs, which the people living here did not appreciate. There were a few very famous uprisings, the most famous led by Omar al-Mukhtar, and also by Idris al Sanusi. The Italians did quite a bit over here in Libya. Libya, meanwhile, was the Greek word for Africa that wasn't Egypt. So it referred, like, this area was Libya, but so was everything else in the ancient Greek world. But the name stuck with the Italians, they really liked it, and just combined all three regions they had conquered and made it. Libya, and still is today. So the Italians built a lot of infrastructure, they brought in a lot of Italians to move back here, and you know, built roads, built schools, built all those things, but mainly for Italians, the actual people who had been living here for the past thousand years were treated horrifically, um, in all of the horrific ways you can imagine that a powerful government coming in and suppressing a now minority native group. You know, the, it's a tale as old as time, right? You can find it in so many different countries, and I'm glossing over it because it was very bad. Like, concentration camp bad. And this is a relaxation channel. <laughs> Not to mention, I, I started a new medication for my Tourette's, and it said may cause drowsiness, and I was like, huh, okay, I'm so tired. <laughs> I'm sleepy. 
but that's okay because it filled me ASMR and uh, I'm, I'm not in the mood to go into horrific details especially since after researching this country I've had nightmares every single night so not getting into that but it was very bad during World War II in 1943 the Allies came in and occupied the area help them stabilize the region a bit, and then on December 24th, 1951, Libya officially became independent as a monarchy. King Idris was crowned king, that one leader I told you about, Idris al-Sanusi. And at the time when he was crowned, Libya was an extremely poor country. They had pretty much nothing left. It, it was bad, but not long after that, oil was discovered out in the desert areas. In 1959, Libya has a huge oil reserve underneath it, one of the largest in the world. So it went from being very, very poor to very, very wealthy almost overnight. The economy exploded. Not a lot of money went to the people of Libya, but it, it all rose straight to the top, right? Which upset quite a few people, including one person named Muammar Gaddafi. On September 1st, 1969, him and his supporters took over the country in a bloodless coup. Idris was out of town, I think having a surgery in Egypt, I want to say. So while he was gone, took over the capital, went on TV, said, I control your government now. We're going to practice like my version of socialism and that's how it's going to be. So he implemented a lot of programs. You know what? Let me just say something real quick because there are people who believe Muammar Gaddafi was an amazing, very misunderstood person. There are people that believe that Muammar Gaddafi was an absolute evil tyrant. I'm not going to say anything because I am not Libyan. I, I don't have any history or investment with the country of Libya, so it's not really my place to say Gaddafi was good in the long run, Gaddafi was bad in the long run. I, I'm no comments. Just, just vibes tonight. Just peacefulness tonight. This is just history, okay? So if you you want to argue about oh he was great for Libya, he was horrific for Libya, write it down on a piece of paper and, and just throw it away. Get it out of your system. But that's not the energy we bring to my channel. So what did he do, quote unquote, good? He did a lot for women's rights. Um women's equality, like in all the aspects you can think of pretty much. But um, I think that's mostly just because he really liked women and not in the, the way you think. I think he really admired women. He had a lot of very famous kind of like celebrity crushes with famous women. He had an all woman bodyguard, like an elite trained female force guarding him at all times. He was an eccentric guy. I think he just really, really liked women in general, <laughs> honestly. He built up a lot of infrastructure, including most famously the Great Man-Made River, which remember when I said in geography, there's lots and lots of water under here at the oasis. It was a plan to build a huge tube to come up here and supply everyone with as much water as they needed. It was never 100% completed. Um, it was bombed by NATO eventually, so it's never really been repaired. Um, but that that was that was a thing that happened, and um, there was also you know free healthcare, free education, all the things that like socialist governments implement. But Gaddafi also did some horrific human rights abuses, just to put it lightly, and he had a knack for starting wars. He fought a border war with Chad a border war with Sudan, um, a border war with Egypt, and he helped fund a lot of rebel groups throughout Africa, most famously in Uganda with Idi Amin, but he wanted like a Arab dominated society in this region. He was very anti-Israeli, like aggressively so, which I think is why the Western powers most um, disagreed with him, if that makes sense. But he was very pro-Arab to any extent, so he would fund pretty much any terrorist group that asked for help. As long as they were Islamic, Gaddafi was on board. 
the most famous one was not Back to the Future. I know that's my first thought when I think of Libyan terrorists, but um, not to make light of that. I'm just saying when I think of Libya terrorism, my first thought goes to Back to the Future. But the the saddest incident was the Lockerbie bombing of 1988, when a passenger plane heading to America exploded over Scotland. You know, everyone on board's gone, people on the ground were lost, and it was eventually discovered that it was Libya who was responsible for planting the bomb on the airplane. Get off, he said, you know, you can't do anything about it sanctions were placed. It was all just a very terrible ordeal for absolutely no reason in the long run. It was just very senseless violence, not just against the victims of the terrorist attack, but the Libyans who were affected by the sanctions from the United Nations. So, Gaddafi was a good guy, Gaddafi was a bad guy. No comment, that's just the facts that I'm presenting to you. You guys can come up with your own assumptions after that. The Arab Spring broke out in Tunisia in 2011, swept through a majority of the Arab world, hit hard in Libya, lots of anti-Gaddafi protests, which NATO and various other Western powers hopped on board with the rebels and bombed and funded all the protesters, and that led to uh, Gaddafi being killed while he was fleeing and the formation of a transitional council in 2012. That power was transferred over to the General National Congress, who have been trying to figure out what to do with the country after a dictator was removed and the, the powers that removed him just didn't really do much to help the country. They are basically starting from scratch in terms of government which has led to a lot of chaos. There have been elections, they get disputed by other groups, the government splinters, there's a second government formed here in Dubrook, and that disagreement within the government leads to other rebel groups trying to assert their power and take over while the government's in a weak spot. There have been a lot of jihadists and many different terrorist groups taking advantage of the situation and causing mayhem. In particular, there was the attack on the American base in Benghazi in 2012. Yeah, um, They attacked a lot of Sufi mosques, which is a different branch of Islam. Um, and very famously in 2015, the Bardo Museum in Tunis was attacked by like Libyan supported, I guess, terrorists. So it's been chaotic. A whole civil war started in 2015 between the different governments and all of the different groups that are trying to vie for control. It's been a very, very messy war. Many different migra migrants throughout Africa have been coming through Libya, taking advantage of the chaos to try to get a, a free trip to Europe like the most dangerous free trip to Europe you can imagine. And it's been very bad, to put it lightly. There was a ceasefire declared in 2020 to officially end the civil war and get back to business, holding elections and voting. But of course, when there was an election, it was disputed and there have been disagreements. And literally the day I'm filming this, fighting sparked up again in Tripoli against the different government groups. So it seems never-ending, to be honest. There has to be an end at some point. You know, Libya has started off this new chapter in its history very shaky and rocky, but it's going to end at some point. Something will happen, something good, I hope, to end the violence and move Libya forward, take advantage of that oil industry they have to try to rebuild the country so that they can branch out to different forms of income for the economy and start thriving again like they had been. So that's where Libya is today. It's very sad, but you know, I have, I have hope. I always do. And Libya is such a beautiful place. Let's check out the book and see some fantastic pictures. Look at all these camels ready to go. Looks like they're about to race. Let's see. There's a, a kind face there. What's this? Oh, the sand. <laughs> the 
desert. Let's see what else we've got. A rocky part of the desert. This is in Benghazi after a lot of fighting. It's very devastating. Political map of Libya. Some girls protesting in 2011. And just a nice quiet day at the park. Looks like popcorn there. It's a beautiful oasis there. The palm trees and some nice cool looking water. A physical map, you can see just how much the Sahara dominates this country. And the beautiful coastline. Lovely, lovely beaches. And you can go swimming in them <laughs> and have a relaxing summer's day in the water. Some cities here. This is, um, Al Kums, very old city. And down here is Benghazi, which it notes in here that like it doesn't really look like this anymore after all the fighting. Very sad. Some almond trees. You know, in Libya they grew all the typical things like olives and nuts and wine, all of the all the things that Greeks and Romans planted. Look at this. This is in the Dafus Mountains. Very interesting. Some rocks all shaped by the winds of the Sahara. Here's one of those really cool rock art drawings there. You can tell it's a big old elephant. Let's see. Eastern Libya and the Green Mountains. So here is what the Kufra Oasis looks like there are these huge circles here with this type of agriculture it's done a lot in like the um, like central areas of America there's lots of these circles you can see from the air as you're flying over it but these bright green circles against the sandy backdrop is so bizarre to see from the air apparently you can see it from space it's really cool very sandy day. It's called Ghibli's, the, the sandstorms that happen in Libya. And crowding by the fire because it gets very, very cold at night. Some salt flats here in the desert. And a big storm. Because when it rains, it pours. In Libya, at least. This is a fountain created by the great man-made river. Enjoying their water here. And here's some water donations after the Great Man-Made River was bombed. According to NATO, um, there were people smuggling weapons through the tunnels, so they bombed it, and now there is water insecurity in Libya. A fennec fox. Very sweet little desert animal. And of course camels, pretty much like the symbol of the Sahara and the nomadic way of life there. Some Barbary sheep having a big fast run. And a Barbary lion, which don't exist in the wild anymore. Oh, a scorpion is on the next page. It's so gross. Just a warning. There's a scorpion. Well, it's a big one too. Yuck. I, yeah, I'm not a fan of scorpions. Anyway, this is a red kite. It says a big old bird of prey. And some dates growing on the date palms and the pomegranate blossom. If you saw my national flowers video, for whatever reason, there was no picture for Libya's national flower. So here it is. There's a pomegranate, pomegranate blossom. That is kind of loud, okay. <laughs> anyway, some more of that incredible rock art. And here's some Phoenicians coming by. And a map of ancient Libya. You can see that's where the Phoenicians were. The Carthaginian Empire is there in the red. The Roman Empire is in purple. The Jaramantes Empire is down here. And yeah, and then the Kingdom of the Vandals, it says, was over here. Here's Leptis Magna, some of the ruins there. It was taken over by sand, and when the Italians came, they started to excavate. And 
it's it's one of those sites that everything's been preserved almost perfectly because it's been buried for so long. Let's see, this is Gadamis, where the Garamantes historically have their capital. And this is Sabrata, a very famous ancient amphitheater that also has been preserved thanks to all the sand. Here's a archaeological site of Garamantes, that's pretty much all that's left of it. The Arab conquest, so you can see they came to this part of Libya, about 634 to 44, and well, 644 to 61. I'm reading this wrong, anyway. And then out here by 661 to 750, here's a pirate ship getting blown up. Tripoli in the 1850s. Big old port city. Italians capturing some people in Tripoli, it says. This is Omar al Mukhtar. He's pretty much like the hero of Libya, like the big, big national hero. These are a bunch of Italians arriving to move into Libya. There's King Idris up here. This is on Independence Day, December 24th, 1951. Some oil pipelines here in the desert. Tripoli in the 1960s, that's a cool picture. And there's young Gaddafi. This was from the Lockerbie bombing. And a meeting of Arab leaders here. There's Gaddafi. And protests in 2011 that eventually brought down his regime. This is in Sirt, where Gaddafi was captured and killed. And here's a celebration of that. What I like about this picture is these sweet littles here. Like, these babies brought their babies to the parade and dressed them up. That's pretty cute. These people here have the, the ink blot on their fingers to show that they voted. Very patriotic parade here. And here, this is the government of National Accord. One of kind of the three <laughs> different government branches in Libya. This is Khalifa Haftar. He's with the um, Tufrik government, Tobruk government, sorry, and um, has led a lot of battles recently in like 2018-2019. This is also in Sirte in 2016. You can tell it's very devastated. Let's see. This is the, this has to be, the, the Arch of Marcus Aurelius in Tripoli. I could probably find it in here, but I'm like 95% sure that's what that is. And a map here of Tripoli. You can see it has a big harbor here. There's the old city and lots of different monuments within. Where did my pencil go? Here it is. So we can read about the flag. It has an interesting history. The Libyan flag has three horizontal stripes with red on top a double width of black in the middle, and a green stripe on the bottom. A white star and a crescent are centered over the black stripe. The flag was chosen by Libya's transitional government following the overthrow of Gaddafi and his government. The current flag marks a return to the flag that flew over the country from 1951 to 1969 when the country was the Kingdom of Libya. The designer, Omar Faik Shanib, was a top government official under King Idris al Sanusi. The red represents the blood sacrificed for Libya's freedom. The black reminds citizens of the dark days that Libyans lived through when their country was occupied by Italy. And the green represents the country's rich agriculture. The transitional government chose this flag to replace the flag used during most of Gaddafi's reign. That flag was simply a field of vivid green, the traditional color of Islam. It was just green. We've got some oil here. Their currency, the dinar, Libyan dinar, was redesigned obviously after Gaddafi was removed from power. So 
there's pictures of like the Arab Spring on it and that's really pretty. And yeah, other famous figures on the dinar. Farming some barley wheat here. And the resources map, you can see how much oil there is and you can see all the different uh, oases out there too. Some wonderful smiling faces there. Population map. Everyone pretty much lives there and along the coast. And you can also see the oases there. Let's see. These are the Tebu people, who are an ethnic group that's been living in southern Libya, northern Chad for ages. Gaddafi did not like them and did horrific things to this tribe, especially during the war with Chad, but they persevered and they're still here. This is some foreign aid being delivered to Libya. And here are some people escaping Libya by boat. Very dangerous crossing to do. Some Berber languages on this map here. You can see the largest is Tuareg. Oh, there goes pencil. Oh no, pencil's right there. I don't know, anyway. Some Arabic lessons. Prayer beads there with the religion chapter. This really pretty mosque. The the all white mosques that are kind of like in right now are really pretty, but with the little accents there, the green, that's really lovely. Some prayer beads here with the Quran. And this is a Coptic Christian, which is a branch of Christianity that's been in Cyrenaica for ages and ages, like since Christianity really exploded when the Byzantine Empire was in control. Here's an Islamic calendar for Ramadan 2017. And it's Eid al Fitr, so this sweet one here is passing out some perfume to these people who are praying. And here are some Sufi Muslims. It's one of those very, like, mysterious religious sects that you don't really know a lot about because it's closed, you know? But it's always described as mystical Islam. Lots of really interesting chants and ceremonies and things like that. Time for prayer here. This is in Martyr Square. There's the Kaaba, because there's always a picture of Mecca in these books. When they talk about Islam. Handing out food in Ramadan looks like couscous and chicken, which sounds amazing. A women's rights activist here, Allah Murabit. Some beautiful artwork here. I guess these are like minaret toppers. It's really cool. Some street art here, talking about the situation. Playing some music. This was at the Tripoli International Poetry Festival that they held in 2012. Let's see, he's done some crafting there, painting some probably mosaic tiles for this it looks like to make a beautiful mosaic like this man there's something about religious architecture like the way that different religions decorate their mosques and churches and temples and things like that it's so much more beautiful than many other different forms of art not all forms but many this is in Kadamis. we've got some very traditional artwork there on the walls Here's the National Museum. And we've got some Tuareg jewelry here. Very cool. Some ouds, traditional instruments. And this guy is Ayman al Attar. He won the Arab version of American Idol. And some musicians celebrating the uh, end of Gaddafi and showing off his football skills there. And he's watching some football and cheering them on. And playing some basketball. Basketball is one of those really good universal sports because it's pretty straightforward in terms of rules. You know, technique is a whole different story, but uh, don't let ball get in hoop from other team is the basic rule, right? Easy for people to learn. There's a sweet little right there. With her dad, probably. Yeah, it's his father and daughter. Some more couscous. Oh, so good. 
It's so delicious. If you've never had couscous, get on that. It's so yum. It's pretty much just pasta. <laughs> and here's some delicious fruit for sale. Get some oranges. This also looks divine. Oh my gosh, this is egg, like fried egg and like spicy sauce. That sounds perfect. I would gobble that up. And this person's checking out some rotisserie chickens there. Some gorgeous Touareg jewelry on this person here. And Touareg clothing. Amazing. This is fashion by Fadwa Baruni. And a big wedding celebration. Brad having a little pose there with her veil. And henna, of course, the traditional hand tattoos that you do mostly before weddings. She's working hard at school, doing some homework, it looks like. And this is the aid boxes that UNICEF has been sending out to kids who can't go to school because of all the conflicts. Foosball. <laughs> the outdoor foosball table you can all gather. They're playing some, some kind of game. Looks like they're having a skip race there. And some sweet friends out by the, the beach. It says that's the museum. Just having a good day being pals. And that's the end of our book. So thank you so much for watching. I'll have a whispered video about Libya for you tomorrow. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, good, good night. Good night. Good night. Here comes the train. Can you hear it? Very faint.